Why, hello, Teddy. You look tired. You Are you tuckered out from your FTP test today? Your furball transfer protocol? It's where you and your brother find like the three feet of carpet we have in this entire house and decide you're going to puke on that. Can't, can't puke on the hardwood, right? Make it easy for your mother to clean that up. Don't look at them. They're not going to bail you out of this one. Why, hello there, endurance nerds. Welcome back to the channel, home of brutally honest cycling trues and emotionally unstable power numbers. Today, we're solving the mystery of why your trainer might say beast mode, but your outdoor ride says, please call an Uber. Hip, hip. Boo, you stink! So let's get into it. Power numbers, the beautiful, cold, emotionless judge of our cycling self-worth. Whether you're grinding away in erg mode on your indoor trainer or out in the real world battling wind, traffic, and potholes, your power numbers should be the same, right? Right? Except they're not. Every cyclist who trains indoors and outdoors eventually has a mild existential crisis when they realize that their indoor FTP doesn't match their outdoor FTP. Maybe you're crushing 300 watts on Zwift, feeling like a pro, only to hit the road and struggle to hit 250. Or maybe it's the opposite. You feel like a diesel engine outside, but barely cracked threshold indoors. You would be in the healthy majority. So what gives? Are you weaker inside or out? Is your trainer lying to you? Are your power meters conspiring against you? Today, we're breaking down why your indoor and outdoor FTPs don't match, what's actually happening, and how you might be able to fix it. Now, the first reason your power numbers don't match comes down to simple physiological demand, or in less scientific terms, the fact that riding indoors is just weirdly different. At risk of stating the obvious, cycling outdoors and cycling indoors are not the same thing. Sure, both involve pedaling, suffering, and second-guessing your life choices, but that's about where the similarities end. Indoors, you're technically still shifting your weight and moving your body, but let's be honest, it's like you're trying to dance in a straitjacket. You're fixed on a rigid trainer with limited ability to sway, lean, or reposition yourself naturally. Micro adjustments, freewheeling, and dynamic muscle engagements still do happen, but they're still stifled, muted, and borderline pitiful. Standing to stretch mid-interval? Sure, if you don't mind your power file having a little mid-interval identity crisis. You're essentially a sweaty statue, locked in place like your bike owes back taxes and isn't legally allowed to leave the country. Your stabilizer muscles, core, and glutes are doing more static work just to hold you upright, and that creates extra fatigue. It's why 250 watt effort inside feels for a lot of people harder than the same 250 watt effort outside. Your body is wasting energy just on the sheer act of staying still. Outdoors, though? your entire body gets to participate, even if you don't realize it. You're constantly adjusting, shifting your weight in the saddle, moving your hands, engaging your upper body for balance and control. Your muscles fire dynamically to respond to terrain changes, wind shifts, and road texture. You get micro recoveries when you crest a hill, slight breaks when cornering, and even subconscious relief just rolling over uneven pavement. There's variation, flow, and constant environmental feedback that helps distribute effort and manage fatigue. And while it might seem like all of that movement is leaking energy, it's actually keeping you fresher. Shifting the workload around prevents those same muscles from getting hammered nonstop, unlike indoors, where you're basically locked into a static death march. Even the mental stimulation, navigating, reacting to traffic, feeling the wind, they can all make the same effort feel more manageable, or at the very least, less soul-sucking. And let's not forget, coasting actually exists outdoors. This isn't just about comfort, it affects your output. When your body can move naturally, it recruits more muscle groups in an efficient and coordinated way. Indoors, those same muscles are on the hook for everything, the whole time, with no backup dancers to share the spotlight. They're gonna fatigue faster because they never get those little moments of relief. And this isn't just bro science. Studies have shown that cyclists tend to activate fewer muscle groups indoors compared to riding outside, which means you're working harder just to hold the same number. It's like trying to run a relay race solo. Same finish line, but a lot more pain getting there for one person. And here's where it gets even worse. If your core strength isn't on point, or if you've been skipping your strength training like a proper cyclist, that extra tension leads to an even steeper drop in performance. Weak core? Say goodbye to holding steady power indoors without feeling like you're cramping in the places that you didn't even know existed. This paradoxically can also explain why some people can actually put out more power indoors. If you have a naturally strong core, train in a rigid position often, or rely on precise pedaling mechanics rather than those movement adjustments, you might not experience a power drop inside. In fact, a good number of time trialists and triathletes who spend hours locked in an aero position sometimes feel like their power is higher indoors simply because their body is used to the demand. But for the rest of us, holding high power indoors can feel like a fight because your body isn't working with you, it's working against you. And that's one of the big reasons, aside from Zwift's pack dynamics and strategy voodoo, that even top tier pros get absolutely wrecked by elite amateurs in virtual races. Nobody's out here claiming that a community A racer is stronger than a world tour rider, but indoors, raw power isn't everything. If you can't apply it efficiently in the pain cave, you're just another data file waiting to get dropped. Now, you might be thinking this sounds like you're stuck. After all, you can't exactly turn your trainer into an open road or slap terrain variability onto your living room floor, but you can train your body to bridge the gap. 
If you're stronger indoors, but feel like a newborn giraffe every time you ride outside, focus on skills that improve your handling, posture, and proprioception. Do more outdoor riding on varied terrain, practice cornering, and get comfortable shifting your weight and position dynamically. Your power means a lot less if your bike handling is holding you back. On the flip side, if you thrive outdoors, but fall apart in the pain cave, that might be your body's way of saying that your stabilizers, core, or mobility can use a lot of work. Incorporating strength training, stretching, and even out of the saddle efforts during indoor rides can make a huge difference. The goal isn't to make your indoor and outdoor riding identical, because they're never going to be, but to make you adaptable enough so that the transition doesn't feel like switching sports entirely. But this is just one of the reasons that indoor and outdoor power don't match. We're not done yet, because if you think that trainer position is bad, just wait until we talk about why you're basically slow cooking yourself into power loss. Ever wonder why pro cyclists spend most of their warm up in what looks like a Timu and Dusty or a wind tunnel before a big race? Because cooling matters, and it matters a lot. I plan to do a deep dive into heat training in the coming months as the Northern Hemisphere gets its annual visit from our solar friend. But even outside of dedicated heat adaptation, temperature regulation has a massive impact on performance. Outdoors, you have the gift of free air conditioning. Even on a windless day, just moving at 20 plus miles per hour generates significant airflow that pulls heat away from your skin. And if you're lucky enough to ride in a drier climate, even an 85 degree day can actually feel refreshing because your body can offload that heat more efficiently. Indoors, you're marinating in your own suffering. No matter how powerful your fan is, it's still not the same as having a constant 20 to 30 mile per hour wind hitting for you from every direction. Indoors, your sweat sits on your skin like a weighted blanket of failure, doing absolutely nothing for cooling until it eventually drips onto your bottom bracket and starts dissolving your bike from the inside out. And here Here's where the real damage starts happening. As core temperature rises, your body redirects blood flow away from your working muscles and towards the skin in an attempt to cool down. Your heart rate starts drifting upward, even if you're holding the same power, a phenomenon called cardiac drift. And this means your body is enduring a higher physiological strain just to do the same amount of work. Sweating without that airflow means ineffective cooling. Without proper evaporation, your body's cooling system is basically running on fumes. And then the big one, your brain starts stepping in. As your core temperature creeps towards the danger zone, your central nervous system actively reduces muscle recruitment to prevent that overheating. Translation, your body forces you to put out less power. This is why so many riders experience a 10 to 20 watt drop indoors. Your body is literally prioritizing not cooking itself alive over performance. But before you resign yourself to a life of lower watts indoors, there are a few easy fixes to minimize heat buildup and close the gap between your indoor and your outdoor performance. First, get more fans. Yes, more than one. One weak-ass desk fan isn't cutting it. At a minimum, you want one large high power fan aimed directly at your torso and another one positioned either at your face or your back for full coverage. Look for something high powered or even industrial grade. Lasco is a fan favorite, or I personally use two Vornado fans that I find a little easier to angle and reposition throughout the course of my ride as I need it. Second, you could use a cooling towel or ice packs for pre-cooling. Pro riders do this all the time, and they do it in hot races for a reason. A cold, damp towel on your neck for the first 10 minutes of your ride can really lower your core temperature before it even spikes. And if you're in an exceptionally hot or humid training space, swap out that towel for some ice for greater effect. Extra style points if you use women's pantyhose. Men, just don't send your wives after me if you go raiding the sock drawer of secrets. I'm really not responsible for any domestic disputes over missing shapewear in the name of marginal gains. Anyway, next you want to crank the AC and dehumidify your pain cave. If you're training in a humid basement or garage, your cooling efficiency takes an even bigger hit. If you can pre-cool your area with some AC or at least get some more air circulating with additional fans, it can make a huge difference. You could also use a dehumidifier, which really won't cool the space, but it can help the sweat actually evaporate instead of pooling uselessly on your skin. And an obvious tip, stay on top of your hydration and consider adding electrolytes. I just talked about hydration in more detail in my latest video about nutrition, and I'll link that down below. But the TLDR is that losing even 2% of your body weight and sweat leads to performance drops. If you're finishing your workouts completely soaked, you're probably wringing out lost watts with the sweat before you're throwing your chamois in the laundry. And finally, ditch the shirt. It might not be the most Instagram friendly move, but let's be honest, training isn't a fashion show and your jersey's not saving you indoors. Even high end moisture wicking fabrics can end up trapping heat when there's no wind to do the rest. Most cycling jerseys are built to partner with outdoor airflow, not to stew in your living room like a technical fabric casserole. If modesty is a concern, throw on a mesh base layer or an indoor specific training jersey. They're not just marketing hype. They actually breathe better and cling less and they don't leave you peeling off your top like it's a crime scene. Suffice it to say, if you optimize cooling, your indoor power won't just feel better, it will Will actually be better. Now, we talked muscle recruitment and cooling, but there is more. What if I told you that your trainer and power meter probably aren't even telling you the same story? Ah, yes, the great which device is lying to me debate. And the correct answer is always the lower numbers are lying, am I right? We've already talked about your body betraying you and your pain cave turning into a sauna, but what if the real villain is just your gear? If you've ever looked at your data and thought, why am I a powerhouse outside in a potato indoors? You're not losing your mind. Your trainer and power meter just might be playing two different games with the same numbers. Because here's the thing, your trainer and your power meter measure power in different places, in different ways, and with different tolerances. Now, before 
before I dive into why your power numbers don't match, let's clarify a fundamental concept that confuses a lot of cyclists when it comes to the fidelity of your power measurement devices. Accuracy versus precision. Accuracy refers to how close your power measurement is to the true value. Precision refers to how consistently it measures, regardless of whether it's accurate. Think of it like this. If your trainer, for example, reads consistently, but is always 20 watts lower than a known accurate power reading, your trainer would be precise, but not accurate. If your trainer provides values that seem to average out in the same way that a known accurate power reading does, but numbers bounce around more than you would expect, especially for those solid state intervals, it might be accurate, but not precise. If it fluctuates wildly every time that you ride, it's neither accurate nor precise. And if it always reads with perfect accuracy and consistency, congratulations. You probably work for a smart trainer company because nobody else has this experience and none of us believe you. Now, it might surprise you to hear me say that accuracy, whilst the most advertised specification for a given power device, is not as important as precision. If you are training, especially in a structured way, it's far better to have a power source that is consistently 10 watts high or low than it is to have one that averages out to within 1% accuracy, but reads so stochastically that you are constantly hyper-focusing on your readout and micro-adjusting your force production for absolutely no reason. Remember that power numbers are little more than a training tool. Of course, they translate into real-world physics and how quickly you move your bicycle through the physical or virtual world, but our knowledge of the absolute value really changes nothing. We use our awareness of those numbers to train and pace our efforts such that we get faster to execute on our plan, not for the sake of real-time physics calculation or vanity watts. Yes, I'm looking at you boasting about your 300-watt FTP over there. If you have a precise read that you can use to measure and manage your performance over time, you're set up for very effective training. Having the absolute tightest range of accuracy is not really critical for anyone who is not using their equipment or sanctioned eSport. If you are an eSports competitor, you invest in the best on-bike power meter that you can afford and use your trainer as a redundancy or backup device. But that's a completely different topic that we won't derail today's video with. The bottom line is that your power numbers need to be used as a tool and precision in your devices is critical to getting value from your data. But let's put a little bit more meat on the bone as to why your trainer and power meter may read significantly differently. Most direct drive trainers measure power at the hub, meaning after the drivetrain. Your on-bike power meter, whether it's crank-based, pedal-based, or spider-based, measures power before drivetrain losses. That means all else being equal, your trainer will usually read lower than your bike's power meter by about two to five percent, sometimes more, simply because energy is lost through the drivetrain, especially if your chain looks like it survived the Trojan War. Now, factor in that different devices have different power accuracy tolerances, and we have a whole lot of variation built in. High-end trainers claim about plus or minus one to two percent accuracy. Mid-range trainers usually claim plus or minus two to three percent, and budget wheel-on trainers, well, let's say if you trust those numbers, you might as well use your horoscope to populate your power file. As for power meters, most on the market these days are about plus or minus one to two and a half percent. This means even in the best case scenario, if your trainer and power meter both have plus or minus two percent margin of error, you could be looking at a four percent difference between them, and that's before drivetrain losses. So perseverating over the differences caused by this stack up is probably not worth your time, but to minimize the impact, I would recommend calibrating both devices regularly. If you're not, you're basically relying on vibes instead of data. For trainers, perform a spin down calibration at least once a week or before any serious ride using the trainer's app. And if your trainer has auto calibration, just make sure that that's enabled. Sometimes it gets turned off. For crank or pedal based power meters, do a zero offset calibration before every single ride, ideally when the drivetrain is at the same temperature as your ride conditions. Temperature drift really does affect your power readings and most power meters are not auto adjusting for it well. Personally, when I'm outside, I like to do my offset just after a warm up to make sure my power pedals have had time to adjust since I store my bikes indoors. But the best way to get a sense check for the disparity, if you can, test both devices against each other. Ride with both your power meter and your trainer recording at the same time and compare those numbers. You'll need a second device or software to capture the second source, but you can monitor those numbers in real time or better yet, do a dual recording. For example, one ride file on your head unit and the other one on Zwift. Then you can use an online tool to overlay the power files and to see where those disparities lie. For most folks, I would just recommend using the utility built right into the Zwift power site. It can pull a ride right from your linked Zwift account, and then it will prompt you to add your secondary source file from something like your head unit. But if you're not on Zwift, DC Rainmaker has a really powerful utility that requires a little bit more technical savvy, but you might find it worthwhile to get a periodic benchmark of your equipment. I'll leave some instructional articles for those processes in the pinned comment in the show notes down below. But once you've done that comparison, if there is a consistent offset, you at least know the discrepancy and you can mentally adjust. For me, I find about a five to eight watt difference between my power meter and my trainer, which can really be explained by drivetrain losses and accuracy tolerances. And for me, I'm just willing to make that mental adjustment for my baseline. And then I can just feel better about my higher power numbers when I get outside, where I'm a little bit more adept at executing power. But now comes the million dollar question, which FTP number is right? And you might think the obvious answer after having listened to this is that it 
would be the one without the drivetrain losses, right? But the real answer is whichever one you use the most consistently. For example, if you use erg mode for most of your training, it actually makes sense to stick with your trainer's power readings. Latency has come a long way over the years, but I find that trainer braking still tends to be smoother and more responsive when it's running on its own power data. Setting your FTP based on your trainer ensures that your workouts are scaled correctly for the device that's calling the shots. No second guessing whether the intervals are harder than they should be or if you're just having a dramatic day. That said, if your focus is executing outside, racing in the real world, you'll want to anchor everything around your power meter. You need to know exactly how your legs feel at certain numbers when you're out in the wild. Pacing, execution, and endurance aren't theoretical. They're based on the power you've trained with, not the number your trainer thinks that you're putting out. The last thing you want during a race or a big event is to be second guessing whether your legs are lying or your data is. That kind of uncertainty kills confidence faster than a blown corner in a crit. But you can also shift seasonally. I do. In the winter when I'm deep in the erg dungeon, I level set my FTP using my trainer. Then when spring rolls around and I head outside, I re-baseline against my power meter and make that my primary data source. Personally, I don't see massive discrepancies between the two and the numbers, but even if I did, I'd still use this approach because that's the way I train. The goal is not to make your numbers match across devices, it's to make sure that they're consistent with how and where you ride. The bottom line is to use common sense. Test on the device that you train on. Don't train on one power source, then go test on another and wonder why your FTP has suddenly dropped 15 watts. A lot of riders panic when they see lower watts when they change modalities, assuming that they've lost fitness. But often it's just the measurement system messing with you. Different devices, drive train losses, and body mechanics, they're all going to add up. The key takeaway is to understand the limitation of your devices, calibrate them regularly, and stop stressing over small differences. Unless you're a pro whose contract depends on five watt margins, your real goal is training consistently and improving over time. So don't panic, use the numbers in the context that matters, and train in both environments. Stop losing sleep over whether your Zwift FTP is 10 watts lower than your IRL FTP. It's still you, just sweating in different places. Now, go forth, calibrate your power meters, and ride like you mean it. But before you do, make sure you do all that youtube stuff, and as always, I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.